There is no people left on this planet that are more indigenous to any city on this planet than the Jewish people are indigenous to Jerusalem. Hello, I'm Jonathan Tobin, Editor-in-Chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org, and you're listening to Top Story, a weekly podcast where I analyze the most important stories happening in Jewish news around the world. Each week, I will break down politics, foreign policy, and culture to provide insights into what is going on behind the headlines. Hello, and welcome to Top Story. Does it matter whether Jews are considered an indigenous people? That's a phrase that is part and parcel of intersectional ideology and is generally used to refer to people of color struggling against colonialism, imperialism, and against oppression. In the intersectional lexicon, that can refer to anyone fighting against white privilege. And for those who believe there is a moral equivalence between the Palestinian war on Israel and the struggle for civil rights in the United States, the notion that Israelis have stolen land from Arabs, both now in Jerusalem and in the last century, all fits into a neat package. We'll be talking about this more later in the interview. But first, the claim that the state of Israel was built on stolen land is a phrase that was used by Hussein Al-Tamimi, one of New York Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's staffers, when he smeared it as a racist European ethnostate. Unsurprisingly, he didn't lose his job when this came out. After all, why would AOC fire someone who reflects the same hatred of the Jewish state that she and other squad colleagues have often expressed? But for many American institutions, one of the tragicomic, if all too prevalent, customs of contemporary woke corporate culture is the way many groups and corporations now open meetings with ritual acknowledgments that they are on stolen land. It involves beginning any proceedings by first stating that those speaking are on the lands of whatever Native American tribe once lived there as the indigenous inhabitants of the North American continent. Part of the problem with this facile and toxic idea of intersectionality is that whatever you think about the answer to the question about the identity of the rightful owners of the North American continent, it might be, Labeling Jews as merely European or non-indigenous to the Middle East or the land of Israel is a lie. These myths are widely accepted throughout academia and the mainstream media. They're often reflected in the coverage of Israel, in which, as one recent article in the New York Times about a Jerusalem property dispute put it, the Jews were accused of trying to Judaize their own ancient capital. The specific controversy involved a Palestinian family that was living on land they didn't own in Sheikh Jarrah, a Jerusalem neighborhood Jews lived in before they were thrown out in 1948 by Jordanian invaders. Other properties in the area are claimed by those who represent the original Jewish owners, but this one involves state land that will now be used to build a school for Arab children with special needs. Indeed, some Palestinians believe that the family evicted by Israel stole it from them. Arguments about the right of Jews to live in Sheikh Jarrah or any part of Jerusalem were the excuse given by Hamas for firing more than 4,000 rockets and missiles at Israel last May. Yet that didn't prevent the Biden administration from condemning Israel in this instance, nor did the fact stop officials from trying to exert pressure on Israel to allow Palestinian squatters to remain on land owned by Jews. The notion that Jewish rights in Jerusalem can be negated by the intransigence of Arabs who don't accept the legitimacy of the Jewish presence anywhere in the country is something even those liberals who claim to support Israel are seemingly ready to accept. Regardless of the theoretical benefits of a two-state solution that Palestinians have repeatedly rejected or about the wisdom of enforcing Jewish property rights in areas of Jerusalem, Jews aren't stealing land there nor are they invaders in a country in which they have lived for three millennia and from which they will never again allow themselves to be expelled. With respect to North America, it's true that the Native American tribes that lived on the continent were dispossessed by the Europeans who began arriving there 500 years ago. This process involved larcenous sales of land in which tribe members often had no idea what this meant, in addition to treaty infringements and outright theft generally accompanied by military aggression and slaughter. What traditional American history is called the winning of the continent involved tragedy for the Native American losers. 
But few of those now signaling their virtue by paying homages to indigenous tribes who once lived on such stolen land are planning on giving their property and homes to their descendants, if any can be found. Indeed, even recognized Native American tribes, some of which are actually interested in getting back some of the places where their ancestors once lived or roamed, have noted the emptiness of some of these pronouncements. Cynics, with perhaps a better understanding of the history of these tribes than those who proclaim their devotion to their memory, might also point out that these indigenous peoples themselves waged war continuously on each other. Many of the sacred lands that some tribes now claim were once sacred to other tribes who were defeated, dispossessed, and slaughtered much in the same manner that white Europeans would ultimately do to them. The notion that this process of dispossession was immoral rather than merely the way groups of human beings had always interacted with each other since time immemorial, with the strong subjugating the weak, was a modern invention that didn't become widely accepted until the late 20th century. That change in thinking, of course, is a good thing, even if the retrospective pronouncement that some who did it were evil while others were not is both anachronistic and lacking in both context and historical background. After all, the idea that the world would have been a better place had Europeans never arrived in America, and that the republic that would help rid the world of Nazism and defeat Soviet communism should not have been created is absurd as well as ahistorical. It's also ironic that a lot of the same people who believe in open borders with the United States and that all illegal immigrants should be somehow granted amnesty also believe that Native Americans had a right to exclude white Europeans from immigrating to a mostly empty continent in the past. Yet even those who care, as perhaps we all should, about Native American rights need to realize a key fact about the Middle East. Jews, whether their families came from Europe or are part of the majority of Jewish Israelis who trace their roots to the Middle East or North Africa, are indigenous to the land of Israel. The whole of Jewish history and that of that land is bound up with that. That's why Palestinians and those who support the anti-Semitic BDS movement, like one of the leaders of the Presbyterian Church USA, who used a Martin Luther King Jr. Day sermon to claim that Israelis are enslaving Palestinians, are at such pains to deny Jewish history. Contrary to intersectional myths, Zionism is not an expression of colonialism or imperialism. It is the national liberation movement of the Jewish people. Far from being the apartheid state that leftists claim, it is the sole democracy in the region. Absorbing these concepts is difficult for those who have been indoctrinated in woke doctrines that define Jews as both white and privileged, and therefore to be disparaged and fought. Just as important, they must also understand that their acceptance of these lives enables anti-Semitism and rationalizes violence, whether from Palestinian terrorists like Hamas or Hezbollah, or those who attack American synagogues. Far from being a harmless woke myth, the fallacy about Jews stealing land doesn't merely enable slander. It is the foundation on which most forms of anti-Semitic hate, delegitimization, and terrorism rest. And now to today's interview. It's axiomatic that if you want to learn about Jewish history, all you have to do is go just about anywhere in Israel and start digging. The story of the Jewish people is all there in the archaeological evidence, and in no place is that more true than in Jerusalem, the ancient capital of the Jewish people. Yet there, as elsewhere in the country, those who oppose Zionism choose to deny reality about the present, and most particularly the past. And if the idea about Jews stealing land helps justify anti-Semitic hate in the United States, how much more so is it true in Israel, where the Sheikh Jarrah property dispute was used to justify Hamas's latest rocket offensive against Israeli civilians last spring? As crazy as it sounds, Palestinian Authority figures, like its leader Mahmoud Abbas, deny the existence of the ancient Jewish temple and other facts about the past, in spite of the rather impressive ruins like the Western Wall that exist to give their assertions the lie. And in no case has the facts about the past and the effort to preserve evidence of it, as well as to allow more people to learn from it, have been more controversial than in the city of David, 
the site in Jerusalem where the ancient kingdom of Israel, founded by King David, existed. This tale of how such a marvel has been developed into an archaeological park and historic monument is one of the more fascinating stories of contemporary Jerusalem. And like just about everything else, it has become the source of controversies fueled by those who either don't know or don't care about the truth with respect to Jerusalem or Jewish history. To discuss this topic, we have one of the people responsible for helping to create the current City of David site. Doron Spielman is the vice president of the City of David, the ancient Jerusalem tourist and archaeological site where he has worked since 2002. Since 2000, Spielman, a native of the United States, has served as a spokesperson for the Israel Defense Forces and continues to serve in this unit for frequent reserve duty. In his capacity as an IDF spokesman, he serves. He has appeared in the international media, explaining the IDF's work to outlets like CNN, Fox News, BBC, Al Jazeera, The New York Times, and others. Darun Spielman, welcome to Top Story. Jonathan, it's a great pleasure. Thank you for having me. Oh, well, we're thrilled to have you. Um, first, Jerome, I want to ask you, just tell us the story of the city of David, how it was discovered, and how the site was developed. Um, just give us some background on uh, what exactly we're talking about. Absolutely. Well, Jonathan, the city of David is unique, and not only because I've been there for 20 years, but essentially the city of David can be known as one other word, which is actually Jerusalem. Most people, when they think of Jerusalem, they think of the, the sun setting over the walls of the old city, maybe glinting off the Dome of the Rock or the Western Wall. And they think back to the times of the Bible that this was Jerusalem. However, actually Jerusalem from the time of the Bible is outside those walls, around 300 yards outside those walls, on a small hilltop that was completely forgotten, which is where the city of David lies underneath the ground. So if we open up the Bible and we flip through the pages of the Bible, the book of Kings, the book of Samuel, Isaiah, Ezekiel, all the different prophets and the story of King David, it is actually taking place in a small hilltop around 11 acres in size known as the city of David. And the story really begins around 150 years ago. The, the star of the story is none other than Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria, it's around 1867, and she, like many of the leaders of, uh, of the free world, the Western world at that time, had dreams of finding the treasures of Solomon. And that's actually how we found the city of David. So she sends a Navy captain named Captain Charles Warren to the Holy Land with one mission, bring back to England, to the British Museum, the treasures of Solomon. So Charles Warren comes and he engages in an incredible adventure and while he does not find the treasures of Solomon, he does, in fact, find the actual city of David. And that's from piecing together a line in the Bible and matching that to the site itself. And that is how the city of David really, the first light shone on the city of David for 2,000 years. Yeah. Um, now, you speak of it being outside of the what we now know as the old city walls. Um, you know, a few hundred yards away from it. Now, this was part of the the area that was, in fact, illegally occupied by Jordan during the 19 years that Jerusalem was occupied by Jordan. Um, and that's enough for some people to say that no Jews should be there. But Jewish ties to this particular spot go back a lot further than 1967, don't they? Well, I'll tell you, the, the Jewish connection to Jerusalem and the city of David has been documented on one hand in the Bible, but on the other hand in the actual discoveries we've made as going back 3,000 years. Meaning, I, I think if we put it in indigenous terms, there is no people left on this planet that are more indigenous to any city on this planet than the Jewish people are indigenous to Jerusalem. We have a, a plethora of discoveries. You know, very recently in our, under our parking lot where I used to park my car, known as the Givati parking lot. One of numerous places in the city of David, we removed all the cars. We had an MRI done. And with the Israel Antiquities Authority, we dug eight stories underneath the ground. And as you go down through the different layers, you go from the Muslim layer down through the different Muslim periods to the Christian periods, down to the second temple, the first temple Jewish period. We're not even at the lowest layer. We uncover a house burnt totally by fire. The first thing we realized was that the burning took place with the destruction of the first temple. 
We clear away the burning and we see a small clay seal, the size of your fingernail with small little writing on it, which it was basically, it was the impression from a signet ring that it survived. And if you look at this little seal, it says on it, Natan Melech, that's the guy's name, Nathan the King, Natan Melech, the servant of the king. Well, first of all, it's in ancient Hebrew, the language of the Jewish people today. Second of all, if you open up the Bible to the book of Kings, the second book of Kings in chapters 22, 23, 24, Natan Melech, the servant of the king, appears. And he is he's living 700 BCE. So again, just to reflect back, when you ask about 1967, when, when Jordan, uh, when Israel finally liberated Jerusalem from Jordanian illegal occupation, it was simply going home. It was simply going home. Right. Right. Um, in terms of sort of the last 150 years, you spoke about uh, Warren coming um, with, with the first, you know, archaeological work. But that property itself is owned by Jews, wasn't it? Yeah, this is true. So what happened was Captain Charles Warren uh, uncovers this, the water channel of Jerusalem. And at first, he's not sure what it was. He sees it's full of water. And in fact, that's what uh, all of your listeners and a million visitors uh, previous to, to COVID a year were coming to visit was walking through the water channel. And mm -hmm. Warren uncovered the water, uncovered a shaft, and pieced together the story that this is the connection between King David's capture of Jerusalem, which specifically says in the Bible that he captured Jerusalem by blocking the gutter or climbing up the gutter. So Captain Charles Warren realizes mm -hmm. he has this eureka moment on this little neglected hill outside of Jerusalem with three homes, by the way. One Jewish and two Arab. That's all that were on the hilltop. And a very well-known Jewish family still lives in Israel today, known as Miuchas. So he declares, writes a letter back to England, declaring that this is, in fact, ancient Jerusalem. Well, as you can imagine, it took some time to convince the, the Jews, the Muslims, the Christians, and the Armenians that the, all the four quarters are really uh, in an old city, but not the oldest city. Finally, uh, the actual involvement comes in 19, around the, the late... 1917 18, the end of World War One, the wealthiest man at the time in the world was uh, Baron Rothschild. Baron Rothschild is besieged by Chaim Weizmann, who, of course, was the become the first president of the state of Israel and was after Herzl, the great founder of Zionism. Chaim Weizmann beseeches Rothschild to purchase the 11 acres of the city of David as a testimony a testament to the very founding and return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel. And so Baron Rothschild begins to purchase this at the end of World War I. His largest purchase was made in 1921. So the land is bought before any wars, before anything's taking place. It is bought by Arab landowners. I have, in fact, those deeds. I actually carry them with me because if anyone around the world wants to challenge our connection to this area historically, it's obvious we've been here. Even in the modern day, Ages before the War of Independence, more than two and a half decades before, Baron Rothschild, in fact, owns this land. Right. Yeah, that's uh, that's exactly right. Um, I know um, I interviewed the late great archaeologist Elat Mazar around the time when she announced her discovery of what she believed to be the Palace of David. And she told me about how the text of the Bible helped guide her to this incredible find. And she said to me, once you got there, she said, now the, sp the stones will speak. Um, they did speak, but it seems a lot of people, even in the archaeological community, as well as those with political access to grind, didn't want to listen, did they? You know, when a lot, Dr. Dr. Mazar, a lot, who is also a, a, a dear friend, a colleague, I'm not an archaeologist, but we were colleagues in the, in really the establishing of the, of the city of David, a lot was very bold and she was willing to take the unworn path, the path that had been worn only by her grandfather, you know, close to 70 years ago, which was that the Bible, it seems so obvious, the Bible is a, is a valid document to use when we're digging. You know, if you mentioned any other docu mm -hmm. document in the entire world and said, should this be, you know, have some historical background for digging, people would probably say yes. Because the Bible is is such a proof text of the Jewish connection to the land of Israel. And because it is not only a historical document, it's also a theological document, it causes a lot of nerves to shake in people, especially people who consider themselves to be scientific and atheists. 
But a lot said, no, I'm going to use this book. It's as valid as any other book. And when she found what she believed to be King David's palace, and she came out with the news, and I, I think maybe a lot could have put a little bit more time into it for peer review, but I think at the same time she realized that there are sensitivities to King David's palace and it was important to put it out there. When she did put it out there, without even reading the commentary, a number of Israeli archaeologists jumped all over her, and especially from Tel Aviv University, which today we have uh, very warm relations with. However, from the moment they jumped on Dr. Mazar until today, the shift has been more and more and more in her favor. And the reason is, is because Dr. Mazar found not only two seals, both of which appear in the book of Jeremiah in the same sentence, within a very small distance from each other, maybe 20 meters, she found just up the hill a seal of King Hezekiah, which is 150 years before her original seals. And she found an additional seal of Isaiah the prophet. When you put all of this together and you look at Jerusalem, you realize that we're at the Acropolis of the mountain. Uh, in the archeological community, I think a lot is being more and more and more recognized. Unfortunately, she's not here uh, any longer to see it, but you know, she's seeing it from above. And, um, and I'm sure she's very, very proud. And the key for Dr. Mazar is that we create a generation of archaeologists who are willing to follow in her footsteps, who are open to using the Bible as a document. I, I think even Tel Aviv University was digging in the city of David. The seal that I explained to you of Natan Melech, they found it and they clearly matched it to uh, those passages of the Bible. Yeah, that's the amazing thing here. Um, people... I think especially many Jews tend to think of the Bible as just a book. It's with stories. It's about metaphors. But there are parts of it that are basically historical uh, annals of the Jewish people from 3,000 years, 2,000, 3,000 years ago. And literally the physical stuff that has been dug up from this site, um, just, just it's, you know, I, I, I can't emphasize this enough to look at it. You're seeing names from the Bible. It's actually there. It, it's not made up. It's it's just literally physical proof that this is a historical document as well as everything else. You know, you're, you, you really hit the nail on the head, uh, Jonathan, and the reaction, I love seeing the reaction of people who come to the city of David, you know, like most people, you know, cell phones plugged into the network, plugged into the Wi-Fi and WhatsApp and everything else and living the, the technological generation. And the farthest thing from their mind is really trying to connect, in many cases, with the Bible, which for most people, including myself, for a very long period of time, after my bar mitzvah was on some dusty shelf, you know, just, uh, just kind of rotting away on some shelf. And you bring them to the city of David, to the palace of King David. And when they read those passages in English because many Jews, Gentiles, people from all over the world don't read Hebrew, and then you show them those seals, it's like an entire aura goes through them. And it's that, that ray of hope. Wow, this book is not just King Arthur. There's actual fact in this book. You know, it, it's, I'm not telling you know these people, and neither are all of them coming to the conclusion that they then have to live an entirely devout life. However, it, it creates a fracture, a major fissure in this idea that it is all myth. Because the city of David shows that there are tons and tons of elements here which are factual. And I would say, Jonathan, you know that, that the average person has this experience no matter where they're coming from. But also, this experience is very scary for other people. For people who've created an alternative narrative to the history in the region... And that is, you know, one of the reasons why you, it is for, on a positive side, the city of Dave is incredible. And yet there is a large, like, actually, I don't know if it's a, large, a powerful force of people who would love nothing more than for us just to cover it back up again with dirt. Yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to get to next. Uh, opposition has continued from those supporting the efforts of uh, local Arabs and others to stop the dizzing, digging, stop the preservation um, of the site, and that includes the Pilgrim's Way, which um, is now underground, um, which we want you to tell us about. Can you tell us about the efforts to uncover it and whether or not it's actually interfering with the lives of anybody who, who currently lives in the area? 
So the pilgrimage road is uh, really to understand the pilgrimage road, we have to go back and understand the area of the Shiloh pool, or as it's known in English, the Siloam pool. I remember the day I was sitting in my office, it was uh, the end of May, beginning of June 2004, and a phone call came in uh, that the Israel Antiquities Authority were, were actually walking down the street, having just left a dig near the, the spring of the city of David, and they saw municipal workers were digging up a sewage line. And so they obviously went over just to make sure that there was nothing there. And while their, their digger machine is pulverizing the ground, they hear the noise that it has reached a large stone. It's trying to pulverize this large stone and they immediately stop. This is Professor Ronnie Reich, who is one of the most esteemed archeologists in the state of Israel, and Eli Shukrun, both of whom are from the Israel Antiquities Authority, from Haifa University and Hebrew University. They stop the tractor, they get down on their hands and knees, they clear away some of the dirt where it was pulverizing, and they see a glistening limestone, perfectly 90 degree angle. And they begin uncovering with their hands and they sweeping it aside. And what they uncovered was a stair. The stair today is about 150 feet long. From that stair, we uncovered another 20 stairs going down towards a monumental pool which is the first thing we found, which is really the size of two Olympic sized pools. And, you know, this probably wasn't a swimming, you know, it wasn't uh, an Olympic swimming contest going back 2000 years. Very quickly, people realize what is this amount of water to be used for? Obviously, a mikvah, right? This is a ritual bath going back to that time. So Professor Reich said, you know, he, he said this is clearly a mikvah. And it actually explains how you had so many hundreds of thousands of people going to the Temple Mount. The only problem is, is that, that, that just to just interject, this is a time while the second this is you've uncovered something that is a relic from the time when the second temple was still te was still standing. Um, and this was part of um, sort of the tourism of the area. You know, the P Jews would come to Jerusalem to visit the temple as, as part of the religious obligations or just to see it. So this is the context for what you've discovered was discovered there, right? Absolutely. And in fact, it's, it comes from the Second Temple period, goes back around 2,000 years, but it is actually written about all the way back in the Bible itself. So it's actually written about 2,500 years ago uh, in the book of Nehemiah. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we realize that the pool we see today that's 2,000 years old was sitting on an earlier pool. And just like you said, this the only way people could go to the actual temple was to purify men, women, and children would have purified in this mikvah. In this bath however there's one problem the bath the mikvah is is two and a half thousand feet from the gates of the temple and as you know if a person is in a state of ritual purity they cannot touch another person that's not pure so the question was how could they possibly have traversed the entire city mobbed with people during the passover festival all cramming together to go to the temple without touching somebody that was not pure and that is where uh, you mentioned the pilgrimage road. Professor Reich uh, said to everyone there, including myself, he said, if this is the ritual bath, we will find a road leading all the way up to the entrance of the Temple Mount. And the archaeologists began to dig. And lo and behold, they found the first stones of that road, which you can see to this day, which are, they look like they're new. They were still worn smooth from the, the leather heels of the sandals that, that the Jewish people and non-Jewish people wore 2,000 years ago. And the road essentially goes from this ritual bath all the way up the hill through the city of David and comes out and then branches off and goes up to the Holy Gates, which is the, the, uh, the main entrance of the temple. And so the pilgrimage road, I mean... I, I should add that two years ago, um, just before the pandemic, when I was there in Jerusalem with you, with my daughter, as a matter of fact, you showed this to us. And it is like, it is like a pavement that was just laid. It, it, it is that clean. Um, it, it, you know, it's an, it's an amazing artifact. And it's not just an artifact, it's an amazing, you know, structure that exists um, as if it was just frozen in time, wasn't it? You know, it is, it's remarkable, Jonathan, because like you said, we journeyed on it together. Uh, it is actually, uh -huh. right, it's an archaeological journey. It's not, the difference between this discovery uh, and so many others is it's not behind glass in a museum. This is something like, you know, you know, like we went through with your family. 
your own footsteps are echoing in the exact same place of the footsteps of the Jewish people going back 2,000 years ago. And it elicits an emotional and intellectual response that is so powerful that I cannot tell you the number of times I've been on this road with military generals or, you know, heads of Fortune 500 companies or whoever else, and they just simply break down and cry because it's the very reason we return to the state of Israel. And it, when a lot says the stones speak, it's so powerful because it was this road on one hand, as we walked together, that the Jewish people would have celebrated as they ascended. The Mishnah explains that there were songs and people playing the flute and juggling fire. People were buying their spices and their food and their sacrifices, and they were walking together as families, very, very intimately as families and as a nation. And on one hand, you have the celebration. And on the other hand, we know from Josephus Flavius, the historian, that just beneath their feet through the water tunnel, after Rome attacks Jerusalem, the last Jews of Jerusalem were heading in the other direction. They were squeezing uh -huh. that little water channel. And I was in Masada yesterday, and I, I was there. They were trying to escape to Masada. And uh, unfortunately, as Josephus writes, those 2,000 men, women, and children, the last people in all of Jerusalem, who were squeezing through the sewer, just like it, of course, brings up lots of images of the Holocaust, to try to sneak out to to Masada were, were caught and, and most of them were killed. And it's both of these experiences just, you know, a couple feet from each other. Yeah, it, it's it's amazing. And in fact, one of sort of the artifacts that you found in uncovering this massive structural artifact, and which you showed me at the time, was a coin from the revolt um, that was found on the, this Pilgrim Wave, which was a coin minted during the the years of uh, the rebellion against Rome, um, in you know after CE uh, sixty seven, um, uh, tell me about that and finding that and how that's been preserved there. So the the coin there were a number of coins as you were mentioning. You know, in Rome as part of their policy of of conquering and rule, you were able to live under Roman dominion. You were not allowed, at least we were not allowed, to practice our own religion freely for much of that, but. For sure, there was one thing you could not do. You could not print your own currency. It was absolutely forbidden for any vassal state to still maintain their own currency. If you were ruled by Rome, you had to tie right into the Roman exchange. And um, therefore, the Jewish people stopped printing their own currency. However, around, as you were mentioning, the year 66 CE, when the Roman decrees were so harsh that essentially the Jews felt they had nothing else to lose and they revolted against the Romans, one of the first things the Jewish people did in the most rudimentary printing presses, they printed their own coin, which we saw together, which the first coin they printed actually was in the second year of the revolt. The revolt was four years. The first coin says second year of the revolt, and you flip it over on the other side, and it says Cherut Zion, for the freedom of Zion. And uh, since you were with us, uh, Jonathan, over, over the last few months, we found third-year coins and even a fourth-year coin. That would have been wow. just mm -hmm. months before the destruction. And, you know, you look at this little coin. It's a little flimsy piece of bronze. And, and we often show it to school kids. And we show them this little piece of bronze. And they look at it. And then we show them the Roman coin. Because the Romans minted a victory coin. After they were victorious, of course, they minted a coin called the Judea Capta. And Judah has been captured. And it shows a weeping Jewish woman kind of with a tall Roman soldier standing over her. And the opposite side, it shows Vespasian, the Caesar who destroyed Jerusalem. And we show the school kids these two coins, the weak little Jewish coin that you could barely see, and the large, fully minted, professionally minted Roman coin. And there's a discussion that, that the educators have. They say, well, which coin won? And the initial reaction of almost every group, well, the Roman, the Roman coin is bigger, the Romans won. And then they proceed to lead them on an educational journey where ultimately these children are asked, do you have any Romans that you are friends with today? And it is that moment where those children realize that they do not have any Romans that they're friends with today because there are no more Romans left in the world. And, and then the question is asked again, and, you know, which, which coin was victorious? And it is 
the fact that you and your family and in the future millions of people from around the world will walk up that road, that I think is the that is the validation of that of that that uh, uprising, and it is the validation of the refounding of the state of Israel in uh, 1948. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, one of the archaeological tragedies in Jerusalem um, of the last generation has been the way the uh, Temple Mount site was vandalized, essentially, by the Muslim Waqf, which controls the mosque, mosque there during the course of construction they've done. Um, that inspired then a, a whole project to try and uncover the stuff that was just dumped. How does the city of David take care to ensure that everything that is found is preserved and done in a way so that it is both scholarly and, and respectful of the past? Uh, it's an excellent question, an excellent question. First of all, uh, with the destruction of Temple Mount Antiquities, uh, which the recovery is really being led by uh, by Dr. Gabi Barakai and, and uh, Sahid Zweig, what that really put on the table was this was the largest archaeological devastation to take place pretty much anywhere in the world at any point in time. Even even the Buddhas, which were destroyed by the Taliban, pale in comparison to the 15,000 tons of archaeological earth that was dumped out of the Temple Mount and destroyed. And that really made very, very clear. If Israel is not strong on its sovereignty in an area of historical importance, you might as well kiss that history goodbye because the forces in the world that want to see the history be erased are always willing to pounce upon it. And it's, of course, but it's not by chance that all of that material was destroyed when it was taken out of the Temple Mount, because like the city of David, that material shows the story, tells the story in a way of, of absolute evidence and, you know, proof, scientific proof that the Jewish people were here, followed by Christianity, followed by Islam, which is just the historical fact. And the new Palestinian narrative, which in certain cases led by Arafat, try to turn those around and say that the Muslims were the progenitors of an earlier people before the Jews and before the Christians, it's absurd and it simply falls right on its face in the, in the face of this. So what we came out of that experience with in the year 2000 was we need to purchase privately or encourage the Israeli government to use its sovereignty over every major place that has that is of archaeological importance, which is why today the vast majority of the city of David is either owned by our foundation or is the Israeli government under Israeli sovereignty today. And it's involved buying tracts of land from Arabs. It's been redeeming the land that was bought by Baron Rothschild and again, encouraging the Israeli government act upon your sovereignty. Um, so that has been the, the process uh, at enormous expense. By the way, I should say, in many cases, rebuying land that Baron Rothschild already bought just to avoid any questions whatsoever, paying again for land that he already bought that squatters came to live upon, in, in most cases, actually. And mm -hmm. now that that process is not finished, but is a large section has been done, the next step is the excavations. The excavations today are being led by, first of all, the most respected government archaeological body in the world, which is the Israel Antiquities Authority, by far and away the most experienced body in the world. And the individual archaeologists today are amongst the greatest archaeologists in the state of Israel. From Haifa University, Hebrew University, Tel Aviv University, uh, Ben-Gurion University, you really have a group of archaeologists that hold, that adhere to different ideologies, different ways of going about archaeology, that have come together to excavate the site. And at the end of the day, when you pull a seal out of the ground, or when you pull... Very recently, we found a weight that was written Becca, which is the biblical weight out of the ground. And it's found by an archaeologist and studied in a laboratory and sent to Oxford in many cases, not that, but for carbon dating. What you walk away with is a scientifically proven archaeological site. That is the way it has to be done, because the city of David is a gold mine of archaeology, and therefore it has to be done on the absolute highest level. And it is done on that level. Yeah, let me just uh, circle back to something I, I referenced earlier. Um, there has been opposition to the excavations of the city of David. Um, obviously, the Palestinian Authority, Palestinians, you know, they, um, even Mahmoud Abbas basically denies uh, the historical reality. But 
there have been accusations that the city of David's excavations are somehow interfering with uh, the lives of uh, people who live around it who, who are not Jewish. Um, is that true? And what what are you doing to make sure that it's all okay? You know, this uh, accusation has been has been leveled for a number of years, actually rarely by the mass of the residents themselves, but most often by organizations that are organizations we have to understand that are most of their funding today comes from the European Union, not from the state of Israel and certainly not from the Arabs who are living there. And I'll explain why that's important in a moment. From the beginning of the city of David's, the modern area era of the city of David, the goal has always been that as this entire area improves, it is going to benefit the Arab residents and the Jewish residents of this area. And in fact, if anything has come about by the city of David, it has been a complete and utter cleaning up of that neglected hilltop, better roads, better lights, better traffic, better security for the Arab and Jewish residents of the city of David than ever before. And if we compare it, for instance, to mm-hmm. a village, which is right across the way called Silwan, it's the same families, right. the same exact clans, same names, the family names, yet they are living in two completely different worlds because in the city of David, it's now a thriving tourist destination and it's clean and the lives are better. And I think that when the cameras stop rolling and you, you can always find a couple people who are willing to say the opposite story, which is exactly what happens, especially when you're waving a camera in front of their face. But the vast majority, I mean, the city of David is a peaceful place even with the various uh, intifadas that have taken place over the years, the city of David, thank God, has been quiet. I think a lot of that has to do with the relationships between the Jews and the Arabs who are living there and the overall idea that the entire area is improving. And um, so I, 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 not only do I think those are, that, the, that those claims are incorrect, they are, it is the opposite. The, the area is actually vastly improved. I will say one more thing. Mm. One of the claims that's often uh, is repeated itself again and again and again, and again, the European press say, you know, never stops to try to leap on this, is the claim that excavations are damaging homes. That is one of the main claims that you'll read about in the city of David. And I'm very happy that uh, the entire process took place because it went to the Supreme Court of the State of Israel uh, to a judge known as Edna Arbel. And Edna Arbel has certainly on the political spectrum, is considered to the left of the Supreme Court. It was studied in depth and with geologists, and with archaeologists, and with home planners and home designers. And they handed down a verdict in 2009 explaining that the claims that were made about damages to the homes had absolutely nothing to do with the excavations. And in many cases, they, the damages to the homes were claimed by the, the Arab residents years before the excavation actually reached their home. But again, anything to try to, to try to impinge the excavations uh, has been done. Um, I will just add one more thing, if I may, that sure. it is not as much today the residents, the local residents who've lived there, because now decades and decades we've been living together. Today, the forces that are opposing the city of David are on an entirely different level. Today, the biggest force that's trying to oppose the city of David is United Nations, UNESCO in particular. And if we look, even in uh, just three months ago, UNESCO passed another resolution that erased from the resolution, erased from the resolution of Jerusalem, any mentioning of the Jewish connection to the Temple Mount. They called the Temple Mount Haram al-Sharif as a protest. 19 countries actually voted against us that had not voted against us before. The Western Wall, as always, is not called the Western Wall. It's called Al-Barak Plaza. Now, even Muslims don't know what Al-Barak Plaza is. It's, it's simply the Western Wall. Um, and the city of David, our claim to fame in all these UNESCO resolutions, is that the, the city of David is called upon constantly to immediately cease its excavations in the area. Now, you know, we could ask, okay, you want to call on someone to cease their excavations? There's lots of excavations happening all over Israel in places in Judea and Samaria. Forget that excavations are happening in Iran and Saudi Arabia and South Sudan and everywhere else in the world. You know, why, why the city of David? Why is it always the point? And I, I think that, that the answer is really the basis of this conversation. They know that every day that goes by in the city of David, scientists and archeologists are simply unearthing the history that is 
documenting and proving what we all know to be true, which is that the Jewish people were here thousands of years ago. And that today, since you have a block in the, in the United Nations who wants to vote against anything that is pro-Israel, that is why they've been declaring nonstop for the cessation of work in the city of David. Yeah, that's right. Um, Jerome, tell us a little bit about how you got involved in this project and what does it mean to you to be part of it? Well, um, around 20 years ago, I, has, uh, I was serving in the Israeli army. I made Aliyah to Israel from uh, Michigan and I was serving in the IDF. <coughs> Pardon me. And um, I was serving as a spokesman and doing my military service. And uh, a gentleman I knew from the army said to me, listen, he knew from speaking to me, he said, you love archaeology. I have a place you absolutely have got to visit. So he introduced me to Davidala, who was the founder of the city of David. He was a, a great military hero. He created one of Israel's undercover units known as Duv Devan, one of our, our top elite units. And then he came and founded the city of David. And I had the pleasure 20 years ago of going around the site with Davidala and my fiance at the time, now my wife. And really what he showed us was a small excavation being carried out by Hebrew University. But the light in his eyes was that this is ancient Jerusalem and his vision was to peel back the layers and open this up for the world. Now I had an offer at a high tech company at the time. I told him, I said, well, how can I help you out? I'll you know, write you a pro bono business plan. I'm about to join the high tech world. And uh, he said to me the, the fateful uh, sentence, which is uh, claimed my last 20 years. He said, listen, just give one year of your time, one year of your time to helping this and then go on your way, join the high tech world and he turned to my wife, Sarah, and he said, Sarah, you know, just give one year of your time. And as a family, you're just newlyweds. You don't have any children. What do you have to lose? He paid me, you know, a stipend, and it wasn't much more. And uh, that's how I joined the city of David 20 years ago. And I've been privileged. Famous last words, huh? Famous last words. <laughs> one year. <laughs> so that one year of, 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 of service turned into 20 years. And what it means to me as I've grown, you know, as an individual, as I fought in, in almost every one of Israel's last wars, beginning with the Second Intifada, Lebanon most recently, the most recent Gaza exchange, raising a family in Israel and turning on the news and trying to explain to my children the what it means to have BDS against Israel. I'm trying to explain to these kids who understand their history, why, why is this movement taking place? Why are these movements taking place? Why are we condemned? And the greatest answer I've been able to provide, as I've said to my kids, come with me. And I let them sift through the archaeology of the city of David. I let them uncover. They, if you come to the city of David, you know, John, you'll uncover coins. You'll uncover pottery. You'll for sure uncover pottery. You'll uncover things that have writings on them. And when that takes place, kind of that, that the pessimism kind of pulls aside and it creates an incredible sense of fortitude and that is my connection to the city of david it's a deep and beautiful sense of fortitude and and an understanding that we are there is there is a justification uh for our return to the land of israel that's not only based on the united nations decision in 1947 and a word that took place in 1948 no this goes back in fact 3850 years ago to when Abraham melt, met Melchizedek, the king of Shalem, and is documented in the book of Genesis. And it is just, it's, it's filled my uh -huh. life and the life of my family, and I've been privileged to say, you know, Davidola, three years ago, won the Israel Prize. I mean, it's become a site that has really become a symbol for the, the people of the state of Israel, and I think people around the world, that the Bible comes alive in this location. And uh, I'm, I'm just very honored to have been a part of it for all these years. Yeah, yeah. Duran, you're you're still serving in the reserves of the IDF um, in the spokesman unit, um, dealing with the foreign press, you know, sort of switching to that other hat that you sometimes wear. Can you tell us what's that like? And what are the main challenges of representing uh, Israel's army to the international media? You know, I love uh, the opportunity of speaking to the press uh, about Israel. The major reason being that uh, I feel like I'm able to make somewhat of a difference. I mean, they're coming with such disinformation that only a few lines of logic 
and a few lines of showing them and speaking in the correct terminology can actually wipe away so many myths. And so I'll give you an example from this most recent incursion uh, known as Shomrei Chomot, Guardians of the Walls. So I'm on Tom giving an interview on the top of a building in Tel Aviv. There are, you know, rockets falling in the background. And uh, in outlets, this is live. I'm patched through to an outlet. I won't say which country, a foreign country. And uh, coming from the area of Asia, I'll just say that area of the, the world, and I'm live. And I'm answering, you know, how we've been bombarded and how we're protecting our civilians. And we're doing, of course, everything else to try to protect the other side's civilians while the other side is trying to put their civilians in the line of fire. And the next question is, okay, so when is Israel going to use nuclear weapons against Gaza? Now, I mean, this is a, an outlet that has, I mean, is one of the largest outlets in the world. And I, I, I had a very, like a split second, should I laugh? I said to myself, no, I, I'm not going to laugh. And I, I simply went on and explained to them that, first of all, Israel's, you know, never officially mentioned as nuclear weapons. But after I got that off to the side, I said, this has never, ever been discussed in Israel. And I said, you have to understand that Israel and Gaza are 600 feet from each other. You know, it would be absurd to even explain anything like this. And as I'm explaining it, I'm looking at the other side of the camera. And it dawned on me, Jonathan, afterwards why I was asked this question. I think I was asked this question because any other country in the world, I don't know if they would use nuclear weapons, but they would never allow Israel, they would never allow their civilians actually to, to incur what Israel's allowed to our civilians to incur. And I think that um, the biggest challenge that we have is the world does not express sympathy towards Israel, much of the world, some of the world certainly does, but if we actually do not carry out a very, very firm military response, many places in the world, you actually lose legitimacy. You don't gain any legitimacy for that. Because if it was them, they would be bombing our enemies, you know, back to back to ancient times. And the fact that we're not doing that causes them to say, wait a second, if Israel's not responding like we would, then apparently Israel's a blame. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges is trying to explain how we are carrying out a military response, but with a sense of concern and justice and fairness that much of the world, we don't get any points for it. We just have to understand it and try to communicate it as best we can. Yeah. Based on your experience, what do you think is the main source of the bias that is so often detected in foreign coverage of Israel, and especially in the conflict with the Palestinians? You know, I, I think, Jonathan, it is a combination. I think it's a combination of two different things. I think there's no question that part of the bias is a modern-day expression of, of anti-Semitism. Uh, I think there's no other way to explain it. The singling out of Israel, which is striving to be a democracy against all these other countries in the world that are trying to do everything else but be a democracy. Um, countries that have active slave trade going on in their countries and enormous abuses of women and of homosexuals and everybody else. And here you've got Israel, who is a democracy and is being picked on. I think there's one cannot ignore that anti-Semitism has an enormous amount to play. And as anti-Semitism increases throughout America and the world, we can see that Israel is, is uh, obviously one of the biggest targets. However, I do think that part of it is again, going back to the previous statement, I think that a, that a section of this has to do with, we have to bear responsibility for it. Uh, Israel has to bear responsibility. You know, after the Six Day War, it was so clear that Israel had been attacked by our enemies. We had pleaded with our enemies not to attack us. We had sent out every sense of telegram, phone call, public announcement whatsoever. And it was clear that a, an attack was waged on us and that over six days we were able to vanquish our you know, our enemies and expand our borders to include biblical Israel. I think at that point in time, looking back, which is easy to do, Israel made an enormous, enormous error in which we have spent the last 60 years trying to say, we're not actually this, we're not going to claim this land. We're only waiting for you to sympathize with us and to realize we're willing to give it back to you. Just, you know, think of us in good terms. And I think that that was a, that's a critical mistake. I think that that whole approach of we were victorious in a war. We were able to vanquish East Jerusalem, the Golan Heights, Judea, and Samaria. And instead of Israel extending their sovereignty over these areas, 
we to a large degree have created a situation which actually is untenable, if you if you ask me. I think Israel should still extend its sovereignty over this entire area or give up this entire area. And I think to play the mid-game doesn't work. And I think that it's not tenable for Israelis. And I think the rest of the world, like once, once again, going back, if it was the rest of the world, like every other major country in the world, the United States, France, England, Spain, Germany, Belgium, any country you want to name in the world, they have usually carried out offensive wars in conquered land. In this case, it was a defensive war, and we were, and we were, we were uh, victorious. And therefore, I think it is a combination of two things. There is built-in anti-Semitism. At the same time, there is a situation on the ground which cannot stay this way forever. It just, it just can't. And I think Israel needs to be bold and declare our sovereignty. And we'll take a licking for doing it, but uh, those winds will blow by. And I think at the end of the day, the life of the Arabs that are living there and the Jews that are living there uh, will be better for everybody. Um, that, that's my, those are my two cents. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Um, I, I might throw in that, you know, I think ignorance plays a part in it. And I think certainly with speaking as a journalist, I think people look for an underdog and want to root for the underdog. And so long as the Jews uh, are, are, are are not being defeated and killed, as you know, the title of Dara Horn's book, People Love Dead Jews, um, I think that plays a part in it too. But um, I think your insights are very much to the point as well. Um, well, Daron, I, I think we're all looking forward to the end of the pandemic and relenting and for the ability of people to return to visiting Israel and Jerusalem and to have the opportunity to see for themselves what we've been talking about. Um, I want to thank you for your time, your insights and your perspective and for joining us. Um, we also want to thank our audience, whether you're listening to us on Spotify or or any of the other podcast platforms, or watching us on the JNS YouTube channel, or on JBS TV, please like or subscribe to Top Story. Give us good reviews. Please let us know where you're listening or watching the show, and what you think about it. And we'll see you again next week. <laughs>